if I look at your career um, now from your LinkedIn and from the stories I've heard, so you've been an accomplished, yeah, you've been an accomplished uh, student at London School of Economics. Then you moved into commodities, you moved into private equity, into M&A advisory at Rothschild, and then you started your career at at Goldman. So that is a pretty pretty standard kind of CV if I, if I look at it. But it all happened within a short lifespan of three years. So who is Naomi in July 2019? And, and what kind of drove your career this way? Very, very interesting question. Um, I think for for the real explanation for, for my path, I need to go back a little bit further, which is that my parents uh, were both academics. And so for them, after master's, I would obviously do a PhD. And for me, for a very long time, that was also going to be my path. So I did a research fellowship during my bachelor, which I absolutely loved. And then I just had this fascination for, uh, for business and finance and investment banking. And so I did my bachelor thesis on the sugar market. And then from there on, actually, my first internship was at ING uh, in their commodities desk because I had just written my dissertation about sugar. And so that was my first sort of introduction to finance. And then from there on, it just sort of flowed naturally. So during my time there, I saw my first LBO, uh, which I found very exciting. And so I thought, okay, I'm gonna, I want to learn more about LBOs and M&A. And so that's, that's kind of how that came about. But, you know, you meet people who sort of know from their teenage years, they want to go into investment banking and finance. So it's definitely not me. Yeah, it kind yeah. of happened and flowed organically. And, and this organic flow was a flow of relatively short stints, right? So you, you were in the commodities, there was an internship for three, or three months, and then the private equity was also an internship. Yes. And then M&A, yeah, and then M&A at, at Rothschild was also for another three, three months. So how did you end up at Goldman specifically? So everything was short stints because they were during university. So they were just my, my yeah. summers. Yeah. And then my move from... M&A at Rothschild to Goldman, I was in the infrastructure desk. Again, it was that just happened. Um, I applied and then HR recommended me to this team and I'd never even heard of infrastructure financing. And actually infrastructure mm -hmm. financing was a combination of debt financing and derivatives. I'd never even heard of, uh, of an interest rate swap. Um, and so, yeah, again, it was it was a, a story of uh, unlikely things that happened, and then one thing grew to the next. Yeah. Was there anything behind the brand of Goldman? Or did you specifically choose Goldman for a specific reason? Um, interesting question. I think you can hear by how I sound that I've kind of been indoctrinated by American education. I also really enjoyed my my time at Cornell. And so American branding definitely uh, suited me, I think. Um, and then actually I had two friends um, from my university, from my uh, one from my bachelor, one from my master's who were there. And they had sort of glowing reviews about, uh, you know, the learning opportunity, the experience. Um, and yeah, I was, I was, I was sold pretty quickly. Yeah, and so so within Goldman, how did your kind of career look like? Because you spent you spent there you spent about three years at Goldman. How did your career look like there? What was your development within the company? Uh, it was it wasn't quite three years. It was a bit shorter. But um, so uh, as I told you, the the desk was really something totally new to me. So uh, so mm. infrastructure financing and derivatives. Um, well, it started in New York, right? With the with the training. Uh, for analysts, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which of course was a lot of fun, very interesting, very intense. And then of course the FCA exams. From there on, it was very much a combination of learning on the job, but also having uh, mm. quite a few uh, sort of structured systems to uh, to yeah. enable learning and guidance. Uh, well, of course there were not uh, what do you call them the affili affiliation networks. So there was the women's yeah. network. I was part of the black network. Uh, I speak Dutch, so I made a lot of Dutch friends. And I actually, with time, um, yeah, but the biggest plus side to my time at Goldman was actually yeah. all the people I'd met, which also meant that then once COVID came, that was the biggest miss. The beginning of this year, you actually started freelancing. So 
tell me about that. Why did that happen? Yeah. So again, the, this was not not an intentional decision that uh, that I made. It just sort of happened. So I decided to go running in Kenya for three weeks. Um, mm. I'm half Kenyan. My dad lives in Nairobi, and uh, I'd always heard about this place called Iten. That's in the Rift Valley, and all these Olympians train there. Most of the yeah. Kenyan Olympians come from there. So I was just intrigued and curious. So I was going to go for three weeks. And then my thinking was, okay, it's same time zone. I can just do job applications uh, from there. And then as soon as sort of one week passed, I decided I wanted to stay for three months. And at this point, I still had in mind that I was just going to sort of pause my London life and then go back to London life. Go back to your yes. career. Yeah. Um, and then and <laughs> back to my career. Exactly. My parents were getting so stressed. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly it started to dawn on me, okay, what if I can keep running and training and continue working? And one of the things about running is that the, well, of course you have to train. There's no way around that, but being at altitude really helps your aerobic development. Right now I'm in Fauvemeu, south of France. I'm at 1,650 meters elevation. You kind of need to be remote for that. Uh, so yep. I incorporated on, I think it was like June 2nd as a, as a freelance consultant in the Netherlands. And then on that same day, I landed my first client. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, maybe, maybe I can make this dream work. And here we are. Uh, four months later and I have more work than I want. So does that mean that running was more important for your career? Because of course that is something that often, especially at Goldman, you know, the, the classic, there's this classic path, you know, people working themselves up in the company, people working long hours, people, you know, being highly competitive. And of course, I mean, you obviously have that competitive side of you if you're a runner. Um, so so why did, did the running trigger you more than just keeping your career, making your parents happy? <laughs> it's about balance, right? So just mm -hmm. simply having more space for my running and having more flexibility uh, in my schedule, in my commitments. Um, yeah. And also flexibility to travel to races as well. Um, and then in terms of my career, I mean, <laughs> I think my CV speaks for itself. Obviously, I take it super seriously. So um, yeah. Yeah. I think at first I had doubts and I thought okay I'll try this and oh you know we, working only virtually maybe you won't learn as much or maybe your relationships with peers and seniors won't evolve or maybe the work will be you know less diverse but just by trying it out I've been proven wrong on all those accounts um you know the work is very diverse I see a lot of different uh sectors uh, I actually feel part of a lot of the teams that I work with um and yeah, I don't feel like it's stunted my growth at all. I think actually it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's allowed me to really pivot from something very niche to learning a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah that's something I can completely also you know, can sign my name under because it's also not, the first thing I learned as a freelancer was you suddenly have to go really deep into many different teams and you have to keep, yeah, just learn. Yeah, every time you start from scratch, essentially, right? You have to really like dig deep into all the different projects. Super interesting. Before we dive more into into the different projects you're working on, so you just said the first day you register your company, you go to the I guess the Kavika in the Netherlands, you register your business, and then you land your first client. How did that happen? I mean, that's not the normal path of freelancer. Right? <laughs> no, what does a normal freelancer do? So there's this. Um, I had a conversation last week with with John Younger, who wrote the um, freelance report, and there's this a big part of people staying away from becoming freelancers is this uncertainty, right? Yeah. There is this often this third kind of fast phase of kind of drought where you start off being a freelancer, maybe have one client, but you, you have to learn how to sell your business, right? So there's obviously more experienced people that maybe have a sales background that know, okay, I have to sell myself my services. Many people, many people, especially in technical uh, jobs, they don't know how to sell themselves as freelance in the beginning. So it takes a bit of a learning and kind of, yeah, a learning, a learning path to get there. Um, but you didn't need that learning path, it seems. So, yeah, yeah, I think what really helped me was that, you know, okay, I committed to a three-week hiatus in my career, and then I committed to a three-month hiatus, and then I just sort of, I was going to try this out to see if I could just extend, and then it evolved from there. So maybe, um, and I think what also really helped is that, you know, I don't have a mortgage, 
or something like this. I think that if you have, yeah, uh, yeah. if you have long-term financial commitments like that, um, kind yeah. of coming to terms with the financial uncertainty that ultimately comes with, with yeah. uh, yeah. fluctuation, uh, might be more challenging, yeah. but, um, so landing my first client, I, so I knew that for when the day would come that I would land my first client, I needed to be able to write an invoice. <laughs> so yes. I, could, I need to be prepared. So let me just register and see how that goes. Um, yeah. And then initially I started on LinkedIn, but I found that very, uh, very difficult. And then, uh, I, I came to Upwork, which, um, mm. is, is kind of like, a. I was going to say anarchy. <laughs> I mean, they just have absolutely everything. Um, and it's very difficult to sort of uh, weed through the things there. Um, yeah. And yeah, I found my, I found my first client there. So I guess I'm still, I'm still very grateful. And then actually uh, Omer reached out to me via LinkedIn. Um, so that's how I, yeah. I, I came in touch with FinTalent. Um yeah. Uh, what was that first project actually? Um, so actually Omer reached out to me. It was also funny how these things work. So he reached out to me, said, Oh, you know, uh, it's a veterinary project. And I said, Oh no way, a veterinary project, because actually my internship at the private equity, I spent three months, uh, mm -hmm. three months uh, working on veterinary, uh, clinic roll up. So it's also funny how yeah. those random things just, uh, just happen and fall into place. I think it was uh, mm. such a cliche. I think Steve Jobs said uh, something along the lines of, you never know how the dots will connect forward, but backwards, you always mm. even connect. It was definitely one of those moments when he called me and said, oh, so veterinary project? <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And these, so you get your first product, you get your first client on board. Did you have kind of a vision for, the freelance life you want to live or the kind of freelance business you want to build when you first started off? Um, no, is the honest answer. Um, because I was initially, I, I just wanted to kick the can down the road and keep running. And then if I would, you know, kind of see if I could delay the inevitable of going back to a, a, yeah, an office yeah. job. And as soon as, you know, now basically is the first time where for the past few months, two months maybe where I'm thinking, okay, I not only do I have more work than I want or need, I can really think about mm. what kind of clients I want, what kind of business I would be uh, extra interested in having. And also mm. something else that I find very interesting is that, you know, before friends call you and go, Oh my goodness, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and now suddenly there's uh, there's a lot of interest, um, you know, other people are thinking about freelancing. Um, I'm, I mean, I think I have maybe four or five conversations per week with, with people who are interested. So that's also very exciting. Um, interested in freelancing or interesting in work? Um, interested in freelancing themselves. Wow. Um, four or five people a week reaching out. They, they just reach out via LinkedIn? Or? Yeah, so LinkedIn. Um, and it's very interesting. You can sort of, gauge how serious people are by the questions they ask right mm -hmm. so they're very serious yeah, yeah. they're they ask questions along the lines of okay how do you find clients how do you find interested clients if they're very scared they'll ask questions like okay how do you deal with the financial instability <laughs> <laughs> and okay but how much into the future can you project your income and uh you know do you sign uh you know fixed hourly contracts and and actually, I personally prefer yeah. to not do that. I prefer contracts by the hour. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's it's very interesting. I have a lot of conversations about about freelancing and wow. freelance life. Yeah, yeah. That reminds me about this this Twitter uh, conversation that I saw with Elon Musk. A couple of like it was like an a, a, a ask me anything kind of conversation. And someone was asking like, what motivation would you give uh, upstart entrepreneurs, not necessarily freelance, but upstart entrepreneurs? Um, if they want to start a business and he just answered, if you need motivation, don't become an entrepreneur. <laughs> you know what? This is so true because oh, I yeah. hear this with running all the time. Obviously it's a totally different segment, but, uh, yeah. it's, it's one of these things where, you know, if you feel like you're swimming upstream, you're not swimming in the right way. <laughs> you got to change direction. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> it's totally true. Yeah. You know what they say, you know, there's like, there's two statuses of being a freelancer. The one is being unemployed and the other is being overworked and there's nothing in between. And, um, you, you just, yeah, you just really like pointed that out also. So you, you said you have more clients than you can handle. I mean, not more clients than you can handle, but there's, you, you're full right now, full of business. Uh, and you've only been freelancing for, yeah, for a couple of months. Yeah. And actually so, so. I didn't, you know, I don't have a website. I didn't, uh, really with that much effort. So, um, my other client is someone I worked with during my, uh, during my time at a private equity, he's a marketing expert. So I asked his opinion for something. And then actually you said, oh, actually, are you freelancing? I'd like to hire you. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So I haven't done any sort of real marketing. I haven't, uh, the LinkedIn yeah. post, I'm freelancer now. I need work because actually I, I just don't <laughs> touch wood, luxury yeah, yeah. position. But yeah. um yeah, I think that uh I yeah, I definitely feel very grateful and lucky for that. That uh so far, so far so yeah. good. I can keep the dream alive and yeah, I definitely yeah. recommend it to anyone considering. <laughs> Yeah, you can recommend it to anyone considering, but at the same time, it's of course also there is a certain I mean risk that people feel at least. You know, of course, if you if you compare it, we can have the conversation all day. How you know how you're underpaid if you're working for a company and 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 these kind of things. <laughs> you know how you know you don't have flexibility. You know, well, all these conversations we can always have, of course, but they get boring quite fast. But how do you how do you take away the 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 fear of people that talk to you? Also, because of course, especially if you're in in M and A, if you're in the finance world, there is this very clear picture of how your career is supposed to look like, right? There's so much social pressure, there's so much peer pressure on you're supposed to, you know, you, you're supposed to do your analyst years, and you're going to be an associate, and if you like, you're going to be partner, you're going to switch, uh, you're going to switch industries, you're going to be working your way up, and then you're going to make a lot of money. So, and that is, takes a lot of also, yeah, bravery to to get out of that, right? So, so what do you tell people that are scared to make that jump? I think for me personally. Uh, people who know me will know that I always said that my goal was that um, by 30, I don't know why 30, uh, I wanted to work for myself or be independent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also I have a lot of different interests. Um, so, you know, the whole PhD question is not fully off the table. Um, and so when I thought about my future, it always had sort of multiple elements that I'd like to put together. Um, mm. And so I think for me personally, therefore letting go of this idea of, okay, you know, this is going to be the office I walk into until I'm retired. Uh, that was mm. not quite, uh, not quite a thing. I think that, um, you know, what's very different in terms of a corporate structure is that you have, you know, what you're talking about before, you have clear hoops that you jump through mm -hmm. and a clear um, yeah. uh, promotion cycle and clear salary growth path and things like that. And actually, mm. um, you know, besides just the structure and the certainty that comes from that, um, you know, that is, that is definitely very different freelancing. I think... Um, I think that ultimately for me, having the flexibility to run and, you know, be in places I want to be has just made me so much happier. So I think ultimately it's just a trade off. Uh, you know, everyone has certain uh, degree of risk aversion, but if, if you don't jump, then you, you'll never know. <laughs> yeah. 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 With, um, your, your running club. So you quite literally followed your dreams by launching the the 2004 meter club i'm not sure how you how you actually say that the 2004 meter run club um which is a, a running club with a former olympian world record holder in in kenya so in yeah in in eton as you just mentioned um and it is also not a coincidence obviously that you launched at the same time as becoming a freelancer because that that suddenly gave you the time to do that but um isn't it difficult i mean it's 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 i guess it's a side project for you but um how much time do you now focus on that and by time i don't necessarily mean actual time but brain time kind of how much of your focus do you now put into that project that is kind of your heart and soul project and how much of, of that do you um, yeah do you, do you uh, assign to your to your freelance yeah, career interesting question so i think um <laughs> the emerging pattern is definitely that things unfold um 
So I was in E10. I loved it. So I stayed three months instead of three weeks. Mm. And, um, you know, there's kind of one hotel there. Uh, and the owner of the hotel, Lorna Kiplagat, so she's the, the triple Olympian, five times world record holder. Um, wow. And her hotel has 98% uh, professional athletes, visitors. Mm. And so she looked at me and said, okay, so you're a total amateur. Because when I first came to Kenya, I was uh, running 10 to 15 kilometers a week. You know, I didn't have time or capacity yeah. to really run more. So I was a complete amateur when I came there. And I felt so inspired by the location, the people I met, the professional athletes I met. Um, above all, I guess, um, just the different, the different kind of life, right? The life that revolves around sunshine and, and happiness and pursuit of uh, personal other goals. And so mm. uh, she asked me to help her, you know, set up an infrastructure that's really catered to amateurs who, uh, yeah. you know, need a bit more guidance than professionals. They need a schedule. They need, mm. uh, you know, uh, local guides that can show them along trails. They need assistance with transportation. Um, and then, of course, setting up uh, guest speakers and things like this. And so when she came with this proposal, I thought, oh, easy, of course, I'll do that in two seconds. Um, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> Oh, yeah. and behold there's all this regulation you have to comply with and you need certain type of insurance and you need bankruptcy protection <laughs> um and so you know what was meant to be you know just this pet project on the side mm -hmm. um quickly grew into into uh, a lot more but again because it it really grew from uh, a hobby and fun and uh, you know, speaking to people I really enjoy speaking to. Um, mm. It's it's brought me to so many interesting places. Uh, so we're actually doing a giveaway uh, with Air Kenya soon where, you know, you can win a trip uh, to Kenya mm. and run there. And so I'm, you know, building partnerships, speaking to people. And ultimately, you know, also as a half Kenyan, I feel very passionate about uh, getting people introduced yep. to Kenya, feeling make, making them feel comfortable to get there, um, combining mm. running with safari. Um, in terms of you know time commitment, I think it's it's fair to say that um, it's definitely more than I expected. Just because you know, also other things, also for the freelance business, you have, you have to do quarterly tax returns and uh, your VAT, and um, it, it's <laughs> it's definitely a learning curve, but. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. In terms of in terms of time, you know, even um, the two projects together, uh, it it doesn't compare to a full time office job. Uh, I definitely have a lot more flexibility and time to uh, take care of sleeping and calling friends and things like this. <laughs> and, and running. running exactly, exactly. How has your how has your running time uh, changed since you've started this project? Um, so very exciting, actually. Uh, when I got to Kenya, um, you know, which was as I told you, I, I barely ran. I ran once a week, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, I was running forty four minute ten k, and mm -hmm. this Sunday I actually ran thirty seven minute ten k in Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, I was seven wow. female and then same for the half marathon. So half marathon before Kenya was 145 and um, now it's 123 and then hopefully Amsterdam is flatter. So in three weeks, I wow. have to do faster than that. Oh, wait, that was all within this, these Six couple months. of months, yeah. that improvement. Yeah. Six months improvement. So you had a seven minute improvement on 10K and uh, within six yeah. months. Yeah, 22 so minute improvement on the half marathon. Yeah. If that is not a testimonial to free us, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah, but it's, so to me personally, you know, of course I love numbers and statistics and I'm one of these people that, you know, sleeps with my Garmin and the first thing to do when I wake up is check what my resting heart rate was during my sleep. So like, I really, really love numbers and I really love the improvement that I'm seeing from the numbers, but ultimately um, yeah, yeah. it's just the, the joy that comes from progress and the daily, um, the daily variation in running and you know, before Kenya, I also didn't know that, you know, you shouldn't go out the door and try to run at full capacity every time. And, you know, mm -hmm. having a training schedule where more than half of your runs should feel like four out of 10 effort. 
so that the other runs yeah. can be a lot harder effort. You know, those were all very new insights to me, but the variations made it so much more fun. And, you know, I really don't need any motivation. I feel, I feel inspired and excited to run every day. So mm. yeah, it's really been about yeah. fun. Yeah. The numbers are just bonus. <laughs> Yeah, it's awesome. Naomi, thanks so much for for sharing your story. If if more people want to reach out to you and ask, uh, yeah, talk about their fears and their uh, expectations of freelance life, where can they reach you? Um, so of course they can reach me on uh, on uh, LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn is Naomi Roma. Um, they can reach me. Uh, actually, my LinkedIn also has my email address. And otherwise, uh, I'm if they're interested in running, I'm on instagram with the 2400 meter run club or uh naomi Talasso is my instagram as well awesome naomi it was a pleasure to talk to you thanks so much likewise thank you very much